<laughs> Just because there's 12 of us doesn't mean it has to sound like 12. It can sound like 30. Um, we're going to do this a little bit different today because obviously there's not a lot of people here. I'm, I'm really excited, though, because it's kind of like, is anybody old enough to remember MTV Unplugged? All right, sweet. So it's like those unplugged ones. I always felt like those. Um, I always felt like those sessions, or if you get to see your favorite artist do an acoustic set, it's always a little bit more intimate. So I really like that. Um, I got to be honest with you. For the last two weeks, I've been writing this sermon. I was writing this sermon called uh, "God's Not Finished Yet," and for whatever reason, last night around eleven o'clock, the Holy Spirit decided to move and was like. You're not doing that one. So I started writing it. I finally like came to my senses and, and finally felt some clarity in what, I, what was to be talked about today. And stayed up to like 1.30, passed out for like two hours, got up again at 3 or 4, and finished the sermon at 6.30 in the morning. So, so it hasn't been practiced yet. <laughs> This is the session. So whether it's, you know, a blessing that like it's our, you know, some of our core group here. So there's a lot of grace if I fall apart or 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 I also kind of believe that maybe there's somebody here who really needs to hear this. And so if I'm being honest with you last yesterday, not just last night, the once once I got some inspiration around what I was to write about, the writing part comes easy. I just wish that it wasn't at three o'clock in the morning. Right. But yesterday was kind of a tough day for me. Um, I woke up at six o'clock in the morning uh, to a message from somebody that I'm pretty close with. I've known my whole life. And it was in response to a couple pictures I had sent to sent to them. And the response was, don't send me photos from our past and don't send me photos of your present. This was followed by a phone call, justifying the text, letting me know that why they decided to send it to me. And afterwards, I got a few more messages that took me from upset to, I want to run out the window right now. And I prayed over how I should respond. And let's be honest, in the heat of the moment, when you get news like that, it's kind of hard to get clarity as to what God's trying to speak in your life. And so one of the things that I do is I have a, I have a core group of people that I typically message if I can't message my wife. Alexa was... Um, Alexa was working that day, and I have a core group of people who have a talent for calling me out when I'm acting out of ego, and they'll speak truth into my life. They keep me accountable in my responses, and when I talk to them about it, somewhat expectedly, I got the validation of my frustration and the go-ahead to send a response that was pretty heavy. But before I sent it, I prayed again. And I didn't feel any resistance about it. And that's usually what I'm looking for in those moments, is that gut feeling, that tug on my heart, that I shouldn't do something. You know, it's kind of hard to tell you, like, to hear what God's trying to say in a certain direction, but you definitely know when he's telling you, don't do that. And in this moment, I didn't, I didn't feel that message, so, or I didn't feel that tug on my heart. So I decided to send the message. And it was blunt, and it was the truth, but it was definitely not what the other person thought that they were going to read in response that day. And I don't know where that's gonna go, but I truly pray that it makes a change in their life. And almost immediately after I send that, I got a call back from another friend of mine who I consult with frequently. I look up to him as a mentor in my spiritual life. And I recapped with him what had just happened. And he reminded me that in these moments, we are called to act with grace and forgiveness, no matter how much someone else has hurt us. And I found this to be pretty ironic, considering like three weeks ago I did this sermon on forgiveness. He didn't really say I was right or wrong for sending the message, but he didn't, he didn't like affirm that I should have done it either. And I think in that moment, it's just, it just kind of goes to show that we're all really a work in progress and we need each other. And I love friends like that. The type of people that are willing to tell us the truth and when it's backed by scripture specifically, it's not always the truth that we want, but it's definitely the truth that we need. You see, the community that we cultivate has a tremendous impact on how we navigate and experience life. So it's crucial that we're intentional, intentional about who we keep close and who we look to for guidance. 
The community that you surround yourself with has the power to elevate you and to help you live out your full potential. But at the same time, it also has the power to lead you into the darkest places of your life if you're not careful. And I think that's a good foundation for our message today. And through it, I hope to answer two questions. What does a good community look like? And how do we commune with God? And I love that it's just here with us today. You know, I, the entire church is a beautiful community that we have. But I love seeing the people that are, I, I, I would venture to say the most um, regular, maybe the most local. Is everybody out to Nashville or did they just hear I'm preaching and they're like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, if you have your if you have your Bibles, uh, let's turn to Hebrews chapter ten, uh, and we're going to read verses twenty three to twenty five. The disappointing part is when somebody stands up, then like I completely notice, and that, there goes half the crowd. And just, <laughs> but the scripture says, "Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has who promised is faithful." And let us consider how we stir up one another to love and good how we stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet each other, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all those more as you see the day drawing near. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word and the blessing of this church. God, I thank you for the redirection in today's message and for your spirit leading the conversation. I pray that our hearts and our minds are open and we are filled with new insights to better understand the work that you do through your people. Amen. Who here is a football fan? There's got to be a couple, right? Right, perfect. Yeah, football is kind of interesting to me because I, I really, I think on its surface, I don't really care about football, but I love the New York Giants, like with a passion. It's a family thing for me. When I was growing up, my dad and my uncle, they would cancel whatever cart or they would switch channels from whatever cartoons I was watching at the time and they would just be watching the Giants. And back in the late 80s and early 90s, they were actually a good team. I know the last like 10 years hasn't been, exactly. I know the last 10 years hasn't really been a, a good example of that. But the New York Giants are so important to me that when Alexa and I met, I told her, you know that being part of this family means you're a New York Giants fan. She's like, oh, but can I like the Packers? I was like, no, <laughs> like you can't. And, <laughs> and the funny thing too is I think my mom really dislikes the fact that we've been losing for the last decade. And at one point she's like, I think I'm just gonna be a Patriots fan. I'm like, that is so disrespectful. <laughs> There's no way that we're going to be Patriots fans here. And if, you're, if you are a Giants fan or if you, have a fan, if you have a team that has been losing for a really long time, you know a lot about pain. You know a lot about loss. And you also know how important it is to have community. And I think that's one of the reasons why people love sports so much. It's because when you put on the same jersey, all of a sudden it doesn't matter where you're from or how old you are, you have one common goal together and you take the wins together and you take the losses together. And I can't help but wonder if we approach our friendships in the same kind of way, approach our community in the same kind of way. Do we keep a common goal with each other? And do we go through our wins together as well as our losses together? It's more than likely that it's easy to be in community when we're, when we're on a winning streak but what happens when you begin to go through the losses? What happens when there's nothing to celebrate? And here's the thing, I'm not asking you about what your community does. I'm asking about what you do. What do you do when you're going through a hard season? What do you do when you're struggling to see how God is working in your life? I would bet that there might be, actually this doesn't work with everybody here, but I would, I would bet that there's an occasion where you go through a tough season and you start stepping away and distancing yourself from the greatest gift, one of the greatest gifts that God gave us, and that's his people. We make the excuse that it's because we're introverted, but the fact of the matter is we're just disguising our brokenness with a label that was never meant for us. And before you put on that label of who you think you are, you have to remember who you are called to be. Romans 12, 4, 5 says, for as in one body we have many members, 
and the member do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We are not designed to go through this life alone. We were designed and we are called to rely on one another. And I am a huge believer in the fact that the best relationships in your life, whether friendship, romantic, whatever it is, have less to do with the time and history that you have together and more to do with common values and common goals. There's a difference between common values and goals and common interests, right? Interests are fleeting. You go through life and they continuously change. For example, when I was in high school, I wore eyeliner, nail polish, and skinny jeans. Yep. My interest was circa 2001 Hot Topic Emo Startup Kit. 25 years later, I'm happy to say that I no longer wear that eyeliner. However, what I valued and what I continue to value is positivity and personal growth. And over the years, what I found is that my friendships that were based on interests eventually faded away but the ones that I shared common values with stuck with me throughout the years. And scripture gives us a little insight into who we should surround ourselves with. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, it says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And before I continue on this point, I want to point out that the scripture does not tell us that we should not befriend unbelievers or people outside of the church. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Everybody here knows that throughout the gospel, we see Jesus sit with sinners and tax collectors, and we are commanded to love our neighbor the way that we love ourselves. Understanding that is crucial because we are called to go out into the world and share the gospel and not contain ourselves in an echo chamber. However, what the scripture does tell us is that the people that we hold closest to us, the people that we yoke ourselves to, to help guide us through our most challenging circumstances and make decisions in the most important moments of our lives, should have God at the center of their lives. You guys ever hang out around people and then you start like talking the same way? Yeah, I, I talk a lot like, like Alexa. And the more time I, I spend with Santos now and he's starting to talk a little bit, I realize I'm like babbling a, a little bit. More. <laughs> but your community and who you surround yourself is so important. I mean, I think about, I'm not too far removed from this, this part of my life was where I was incredibly unhealthy. Like I was drinking all the time smoking, I thought that healthy food was a Domino's pizza deep dish pizza. And what made it healthy was the fact that I ordered it with grilled chicken and spinach on top. (laughs) That's like the type of life that I was living at that time. And the people that I decided to surround myself with felt the same way too. And before I knew it, I was in I wasn't just in the worst like physical shape of my life, but I was also in the worst emotional and mental state of my life as well. And it wasn't until I was intentional about surrounding myself who had the value of health, of positivity, of community, did all of that, all of those things start changing. It wasn't until then that I, did I, did I start eating better? Did I start working out more regularly? Did I consume content that was actually good for my mind and soul as opposed to, you know, all of the trash that's out there today? And as a result of that, I would like to say that I feel better as a, as a human being. Our lives, as pe- our lives as people of faith shouldn't be much different than that. There's an expression that says, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So the question is, are those people drawing you closer to a relationship with God, or are they pulling you away from it? Of all of the relationships that we've talked about this morning, the most important one goes without saying. It's our relationship with God. And that's why we're all here this morning, to worship and strengthen that relationship with him through this community. Outside of Sunday service, though, and outside of these walls, I want to ask you how you're treating that relationship. What does spending time with God look like for you? 
There might be a few of us here today, or potentially it's just me, who only seek a relationship with God when it's convenient for us. I'm right there with you. In fact, when I started discipleship with Jason, it was, I guess it was four years ago now, the time goes by pretty fast. I rem- it was just me and him because this was just coming out of COVID. And I would show up and every so often I would have done my daily reading. Our reading plan was like, you know, read five chapters in a week, whatever the case might be. But more often than not, I came and I like maybe read one of the chapters if I'm being gracious. And this happened like three weeks in a row. And I, I give myself credit because we all know Jason to be like fun loving, easygoing, you know, always smiling, wants to know how you're doing. That day he was not that person. <laughs> He was still kind, but he was very stern about the fact that I needed to be diligent. I needed to be disciplined if I truly wanted to pursue a relationship with God. And the funny part about that is it, I, I didn't actually learn from that conversation. More months go by, and for whatever reason, I could, I could still find time to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, have my coffee, and then get to the gym by six and work out every single day. But for whatever reason, 15 minutes in the word like was just not possible. It's interesting how we prioritize certain things. And one day I was sparring with a friend of mine and we're going back and forth. I felt like I was doing pretty well and he lands like a right hook to my left lip and cracks it. I had never felt pain like that before. That day was all right, but when I tried to wake up in the morning, I couldn't even get out of bed. And I spent the next six weeks sit, uh, sleeping upright on my couch because I couldn't like get up. I couldn't use this. It felt like my ribs were actually sliding across each other. It was awful. The worst part is Alexa was gone for the weekend and all I could think to myself is, oh my gosh, she's going to kick my butt when she gets home. <laughs> and for almost a year after that, she was trying to talk me out of boxing ever again. Now, the funny part about that is God took away the one thing I put before him not to punish me, but to remind me that I could no longer lean on my own understanding of what it is to be in community with him in the word he's already given us and in prayer. And it was that at that time did I finally get consistent about being in the word? Did I finally get consistent about reflection and how I prayed because I couldn't go and do anything else? It was straight like Jacob in the wilderness style. In Mark chapter 1 verse 35, Jesus gives us a model of how we can commune with God. It says, and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And I want to ask you, how many of you pray in the car? Awesome. How many of you have missed an exit or missed a right turn that you were supposed to make? Awesome. So if we have Apple Maps directing us and big green signs on the streets to tell us where where to go, and we still miss a turn or an exit, how easy do you think it is to miss what God is trying to do in our life if the only place we find solitude is in our cars? We're out here seeking a relationship with God, but the only time we're giving him is in traffic on the 405 or the 55, depending on where you're coming from today. Both are terrible. And not only do we fail to create time specifically to dedicate, specifically dedicated to communicating with God, but so often in our prayer, all we're doing is asking things from him instead of listening for what he might have for us. Maybe if we took the time to see what God has to say, say about the relationships he wants us to hold on to in our lives, we'd stop settling for ones that were never meant for us in the first place. And if we took more time to listen to what he has to say, perhaps we could start building friendships and communities that uncover the best part of ourselves instead of the relationships that feed off of our insecurities, our loneliness, our addictions, and our brokenness. It's fun. Um, going through this because there's no band to come up today, but I'm excited about about the duo. I'll close with this and you and you guys can uh, come up and start playing if you'd like. What I want to start what I want to close with is what we began with. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 and 25. Let us hold fast the confession of hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 
And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting, neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all those and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The scripture reminds us that the company we keep is meant to inspire hope in our lives. The people that we surround ourselves with are to push us toward love and to do good in this world by staying together. And if you're in a place where you find yourself surrounded by people who aren't allowing you to grow into your full potential, I want to remind you that that is not what God intended for you. Yes, you can find incredible community within the walls of Echo Church, but I would encourage you to let the spiritual standard you have in your life be the standard that you carry outside of these walls as well, in your career, in your romance, in your friendships. Because God did not intend for the people in your life to be a drain on your energy, but instead be a source for it. And what he wants from you is a circle that elevates you and elevates how you experience this life and a relationship with him. Father God, thank you for this morning, your word in this faithful community, God. Thank you for your guidance in every aspect of our lives. I pray, God, each one of us are intentional about the relationships that we have with your people, as we know that it is your people who can draw us closer to you, God. And I thank you so much for access, God. I thank you for access to communion with you and to hear from you in your word and in your solitude. Amen. I'm going to sing this last song, but you guys are welcome to just stay seated if you'd like. You can obviously stand if you want to, but just use this time. It's just a time of reflection.